I feel somewhat left out. I've got Anna, Annie, Anita, and then <laughs> Rebecca. I feel, I feel like somehow I'm not fitting in properly. Um, yes, I could be a, a yeah, Annie as well or Anna. Annabelle. Annabelle, that would be good. Okay, so um, my name's Rebecca. I'm a health improvement lead for tobacco, and I'm also leading on the health behaviour change um, training that we've developed across Greater Glasgow and Clyde. So part of this is going to be giving you some um, resources that we've developed that you can use practically and we're also going to have a wee bit of a session thinking about things that people will say to you, what difficulties you face when you're actually trying to, to talk about behaviours or lifestyles, what are the actual practical questions and things you come up against that we can maybe try and tackle in a practical way so you go, go home with something that you can use after uh, today. So. The first question that I want to ask, you do have to do a bit of thinking this afternoon as well because I know you'll start nodding off if not. Um, the evidence is there, the evidence is very, very clear and I was glad that Annie was bigging up tobacco because obviously that's my, that's my baby. Um, but the evidence is there, we have stacks of evidence, we have loads of stuff that tell us about the benefits of behaviour change and improving your lifestyles etc. So why are people not changing their behaviours? Why do you think people don't change behaviour? They enjoy it. It's, it's the only thing they've got. Automatic. What were you going to say, Anissa? You see it on telly all the time. Okay. If you want to change your behaviour, you look at the adverts and you go and eat a biscuit because there's been a nice packet of biscuits on the telly. Absolutely. Family have always done it. Yep. You've always done it. Your family's always done it. Anything else? Hard. It's hard. Time restrictions. It's comfortable. Sorry? Time restrictions. Time restrictions. Okay. Absolutely. Okay, now some of those pictures, I don't know about anybody else, and I'm, I'm obviously wrong for public health because I look at that and it makes me quite hungry and I quite fancy nipping down to McDonald's, I shouldn't say that. Um, but some of those pictures are less appealing. This one doesn't look particularly unappealing, does it? It's a Friday, that might look, you know, that might be your Friday evening. It doesn't look unappealing, it's fun. Some of these things are, well, a lot of these things are enjoyable. It's the easy option. So why don't your patients change? Quite often we see it as them and us. Why don't your patients change? For a lot of people, health is not a priority. Now, if you picture somebody who's living in maybe a high-rise flat, there's damp, um, they're scared to go out, they're maybe living with depression, health professionals, they go and see their GP and they say, do you know you could extend your life by 10 years if you stop smoking? Great. Why would I want to do that? We think working in a health setting that people are driven by health. People are, if you've ever seen the Dahlgren and Whitehead rainbow model of determinants of, of health, there's lots of other things going on in people's lives that are a priority. Do we ever take time to find out what's going on? Is that, what is that person living with? What are their realistic barriers? Yes, we've got evidence about physical activity and, and all that kind of stuff, but if their son's a drug user and stealing from them, is increasing their physical activity really highest on their list of priorities? Underestimation of the value. Again, this is an information thing. Lots of people don't understand the impact of, of exercise or <coughs> cutting down your alcohol, the links with breast cancer. I think probably most females don't know the links between alcohol and breast cancer. The underestimation of the value that changing could actually make uh, to, their, to their health. The damage is done. What's the point? I'm 70, I'm 65. <coughs> I've been diagnosed with X, Y, and Z. What on earth is the point in changing now? I can't undo it. And that letter was quite interesting, what you'd said, Annie, about the person saying, well, you've had the polyp removed. Hurrah, you probably won't get this again. So it's, you know, the damage is done or it's been sorted. There's nothing else I can do about it. Guilt, depression, anxiety, and stress. And again, this is talking about if you've had a diagnosis, maybe, and obviously my, my focus in a lot of the time is tobacco, but there's a lot of guilt associated with being diagnosed with lung cancer or COPD because deep down people do know that it's been linked to their smoking. And there's a guilt, what have I done to my family? There's a depression of dealing with that and a diagnosis. Um, there's an anxiety about my treatment. Will I recover? Will things be okay for me? And the stress that goes hand in hand with that. So a lot of people are dealing with very difficult circumstances and throwing behavior change into the mix if they're depressed or feeling low your self-efficacy, your self-belief, your self-worth is quite low in a lot of cases as well. So people's ability to change or the, their feelings of ability to change. Low self-esteem and low confidence. A lot of the people that you work with will not have been given 
what are referred to as positive strokes in transactional analysis. They've not been given a lot of positivity in their lives or told they're very good at anything and they have low self-worth and low self-esteem. So we know that just being given information that you need to change is not enough for a lot of people. There's no support. If we just say you have to do this and people don't know where to start, they don't know how your um, control group um, in the, the physical activity, they didn't really know how to get started. It's that kind of, I don't know where to go, it all seems quite overwhelming and quite big. And it's also lack of support from families. If we look at our hospital data for those that stop smoking in the hospital service, 64% of those patients, um, sorry, 60% live with another smoker. So they quit when they're in, in hospital or they quit for a point, then they go home and everyone around them smoking or there's not healthy food available there uh, when they get home, whatever their issue might be. And the effort that's involved if you think about yourself, if you want to change something, it does involve a bit of effort. And if you're feeling low, you're feeling a bit down, you think, oh, there's too much to change. That kind of effort, that extra effort you have to make can be very off-putting in making that change. And another one that's been alluded to is that no one has asked them. No one's actually brought up the question of, of smoking. From the Journal of um, General Internal Medicine in 2009, a quarter of cancer, survivor, cancer survivors had not been asked about their smoking in the past year. These are people who are dealing with these issues at the moment and we're still not following up. How are you doing? Have you changed your mind? Have you thought about making a change? As I've said already, quite often think about them and us. Our patients never do anything we ask them. Hands up if you had your five fruit and veg yesterday. I know it's not about fruit and veg only. I'm just so about half. I would expect as much from health improvement. <laughs> <laughs> now, for those of you that didn't, are you aware of the benefits of eating fruit and veg? And a variety of colours and all the things that go along with it? Yes, everybody know the benefits? All the mantra that goes with it? So why didn't you have them? Inside your head right now, what are you saying apart from what an annoying woman? <laughs> How dare she? <laughs> Anyone making excuses? Giving your reasons? Okay. Anything else anybody saying that they can share with me and the public? Beans are a vegetable or the sauce or something. I was told that once. <laughs> Fiber, that's good, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you are justifying your behaviour in your head. I'm not telling you off because I didn't have mine either. Um, <laughs> um, but you justify in your head. You start to have reason. It makes sense to you in your world. It fits into your life. And as you said, sometimes I do it, sometimes I don't. So it makes sense to you. And your clients or your patients, whoever you're working with, it's exactly the same thing. Their decisions fit in with their life. And they have reasons as to why they are not engaging in these activities. And they vary. And we need to find out what they are. And I don't think we're terribly good at that in the health service. This is a wee man that I invented. He's called Bubble Man. And this is summarising a vast range of health behaviour change theories and probably not doing them very much justice. But it's to think about people as a whole. If you're thinking about this person, weighing up their decisions, what are the chances I'm going to get this disease? People are going to weigh this up in their head. And that's based on the health belief model and is referred to in the big um, long term as susceptibility. So people weigh up their perceived chances. What's their family history? What are the experiences of those around them? What are their belief in health messages? Now, if you ever go into any internet sites about tobacco, pro-tobacco websites, they talk about black lungs as being a, a conspiracy and that, in fact, it doesn't affect your lungs at all. And it's all the health service and the nanny state and the finger wagging. People have beliefs about, you know, the actual reality of health messages. Can it really make that much, you know, pff, come on, fruit and veg or fibre or whatever, exercise. So what are the chances I'm going to get this disease? Family history as well is quite an important one. How bad is this disease anyway? It doesn't sound that bad. 
cancer people have a very different mindset towards. Cancer people visualise it's long and it's drawn out and it's painful, you have to have chemo, you'll lose your hair. It's not, it, that's not a good thing to get. This is from Keep Well Information, that um, heart attacks are quite a good way to go, people perceive. It'll be instantaneous, I won't know anything about it, boom and I'll be gone. Now we know a lot of people, majority of people don't um, die from heart attacks any longer. You're living with a, a, um, a disability, you have to take lots of medication, you, you will, chances are survive that but it won't be very pleasant and you will have to, to deal with lots of medications and other things. So people will, will weigh up how bad it is and misconceptions about delete disease um, as well. What does my life experience tell me? Everybody's life or, or their beliefs are shaped by their life experiences and everybody has different life experiences. Your attitude to healthcare, how others, uh, how people have coped with disease that you've seen, it can undermine health messages as well. What you see happening around you um, can undermine health messages and that classic example being my granny smoked 90 a day and she lived till she was 103. Um, everybody has one of those, or there's, it's a very common story, um, but it's the exception, but people will cling on to that. What's everyone else doing? What are the social norms? So what is, it's all very well us saying, do you know the only quarter of the population smoke? But in fact, if you live in Easter House, it's more than one in two people that smoke. It's normal. It's abnormal not to. It's normal to smoke when you're pregnant. My mum smoked when she was pregnant with me, and we're all fine. Um, it can be about health messages, exercising. Exercising is for people who've got money to go to gyms. And then you've got, would I be able to change even if I wanted to? So the self-efficacy, the self-belief. Would I actually be able to change? I've tried to stop before. I've tried to make changes before and I haven't been successful. Um, I've got a friend who's, who's um, quite overweight and she'd put on her Facebook page, permanently on a diet, but none of them ever work. So it's that perception, I've, I've tried everything, I've tried all these things and I'm not able to change. How big a difference would it really make? What are the benefits to that person? What are the positives and the consequences of ado adopting that behaviour? Is it going to be a lot of effort for not a lot of reward? So thinking about your job, where you work, which of those bubbles can you influence? You don't need to answer. But do you think there's any possibility or any way that you can influence any of those bubbles in your day-to-day -day job? I would suggest you possibly can't, you can't really influence what somebody's life experience tells them. And you can't really influence social norms in a huge way singularly every day in your job, but we can do that on a higher level um, through strategy and, and wider work. This is probably quite familiar to a lot of you. This is referred to as the cycle of change or the stages of change and it's a model by Prochaska and De Clementi which is from I think the late 80s um, and it looks at behaviour change and it's a bit unfashionable now people say it's a bit of an out of date model and it can't fully explain behaviour change and all that kind of thing. I still think it's a very useful way to start thinking about behaviour. <coughs> not everybody is at the same stage of change and therefore we should not be telling the same stuff to every person. So hands up here if you would like to be more physically active. Okay, if I told you that if I had trainers in all of your sizes and some lovely spandex outfits and at the end of today's session um, we would all go for a jog, who would come back and meet me? Oh, there's always the... <laughs> the majority would not. So you're... <laughs> there's all, there it is. So your desire to do something and your readiness to do it are very different things. A lot of people are contemplative. So this is this, this bit here, which is when you're thinking about something, you can see the benefits of changing, but you can also see the cons of changing. And that was the majority of you here um, with regards to physical activity. You can see, well, yeah, I'd like to be more physically active, but pff, I'm heading home for a wee sneaky wine and a Chinese takeaway. Well, that's just me again. Um, but if you think about uh, somebody who's pre-contemplative, so that basically means somebody who is not interested in changing, somebody who is quite happy as they are. Um, if we start talking about um, joining uh, exercise groups and um, signing up for things, I can get you a referral. All you need to do is buy some trainers. I mean, it's a really great thing. Lots of information, blah, 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 enthusiasm. 
they're still not they're not ready to hear that at that particular point and um, with that stage there is there are still things you can do you can acknowledge that somebody's not ready and suggest to them that if they ever change their mind they can come back and see you and you can talk about it again with somebody who's pre-contemplative it is important and i would say um, adding on to what the ladies have said already is relate it back to their condition relate it back to how it affects them not general wishy-washy health improvement messages how is it going to impact on them how is it going to impact on their condition what do they know already because quite often we don't ask people what they know already i've got um, two wee ones and when i was pregnant with my second one i went in to see the midwife absolutely lovely lady but she said are you drinking any alcohol at the moment and i said no and she said well it's just to let you know the effects of alcohol in pregnancy <coughs> blah 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 now I knew all that so I sat passively yes yes and I said I wasn't drinking anyway so find out what they already know you can correct misinformation because sometimes people are pre-contemplative because they don't know how it affects them they don't have the information so find out for them from them what they already know contemplation is that weighing up of you can see the pros and the cons ready to change action and maintenance go for it get them into things refer them at that point relapse is natural if you've ever tried to lose weight or go on a diet you'll know you're all geared up in january and then by about end of january mid january maybe you're thinking oh this is a bit boring i'm quite cold i really just want some chocolate and um, you, you go through a stage of relapse and it's what you do with that relapse so you might see somebody who said oh, i just threw in the towel i can't be bothered what can you do in that situation to try and boost them to try and help them to try again as opposed to just going to the doldrums so with ambivalence that's your contemplation stage so what you're dealing with is that whole idea of having conflicting feelings at the same time yeah but no but yeah but no I'd like to but is quite indicative that somebody is in contemplation there are, there is a balance at that point and what you're trying to do in your role is to tip that balance to try and encourage them to make a change to move around that cycle of change to get to the preparation point where they feel that they're ready to do something about it now working in the health setting a lot of us have come into this because we naturally want to help people which is obviously a very good thing but we sometimes have a natural desire to sort things for people and solve their problems to take care and to make things better for people but what we do when we do that telling people what to do is we take control from them and we threaten their autonomy and we actually create resistance by telling people what to do advice giving why do we tend to go into advice giving why do we know best, we know best yep it's easy sorry you want to help yep in a short time as possible <laughs> You can share some of the experiences you okay it's not it doesn't come from a bad place but i wonder if this sounds familiar to you do you sometimes feel that like you're playing a game of ping pong where you say have you tried this yes it didn't work what about this no i don't think that would suit me well there's some people have done this no i don't think or else you have somebody just sitting going uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. next time you see them they haven't done anything and you end up extremely frustrated and you think why does nobody ever take my advice why does nobody listen to my pearls of wisdom and um, I had a I've got a friend who um, works in a diabetes clinic and uh, he said to me one night do you know I'm gonna stop telling people what to do and they never they never take my advice I thought I'd had this really good um, session with somebody and uh, I was driving home from work and I saw them coming out the chippy with a big bag of something fried and a big bottle of iron brew and he's like I'm not doing it anymore now what can often be for people is that things are very overwhelming if, if there's too much to change at one point you end up changing nothing so it's about finding out what what they feel they can achieve between one appointment and the next when you see them and also people are generally better persuaded by the reasons which they themselves discover than by those which have come into the minds of others so I'll let you have a wee think about that So we're more motivated when we find the solutions for ourselves is the translation of that. So your basics of good communication. 
and we're going to have a wee look at this afterwards. You'll be familiar with these open-ended questions, affirmation, reflective listening and summaries. So this is, these are your ORs, open-ended questions. Um, I'll come on to in a wee second. Affirmation can include just that positivity, just that body language that you're actually listening to the person. Um, just nodding, positive body language, etc. Reflective listening, reflecting back what the person has said. Starting a sentence with, it sounds like, would be a reflection. Summaries are summarising the conversation back to the patient or the client. It sounds like you'd like to change or you'd like to stop smoking, but you're not sure how you'll cope when the kids kick off. So you are summarising their ambivalence to them, the pros and the cons that they've shared with you. And it helps the person think through, well, yeah, that is what I've said. Those are my issues. Open-ended questions are questions that you basically can't answer yes or no to. I do quite a lot of teaching with medical students so, and FY1s, and I say to them, um, you're taking histories from patients. You're asking the question, do you smoke? What do you ask them? Do you want to stop? You can answer one of two ways at that point. Just making a very slight change. A lot of us work with questionnaires and closed questions. How can you turn that into a bit of a, a conversation? And it's to change it, follow it with an open question. So how would you feel about stopping smoking at the moment? You're going to get a lot more than a yes or no. You're going to get a bit more information, a bit, bit, bit of background. And that's the same for any of the, the topics. So physical activity, alcohol levels, healthy eating, etc. Who, what, why, where, when and how. On a scale of 1 to 10, how interested are you in stopping smoking right now? How interested are you in engaging in any physical activity? How interested are you in cutting down your alcohol at the moment? Um, and you can also use um, a, a confidence question. So how confident would you feel to change at the moment? And then you can follow up. If somebody gives themselves a, a 5, then that's a clear indication they're kind of contemplative at that point. Um, so you can follow that up and say, why did you give yourself a 5 and not a 1? What would it take to get you up to 10? So it's, scaling questions are brilliant for getting a gauge of where people are at. Tell me a bit more about that. So just asking people to expand on their experiences. Why is one to be quite careful of? Why can be quite persecutory? Why have you not changed? Why did you not do that? So you can usually reframe a why question as a what question. What stopped you from making the changes we talked about last time as opposed to the why uh, question? So this slide is about, it's kind of summarising the principles or the spirit of motivational interviewing. You might have heard of that. It's basically a counselling technique to help people look at ambivalence. All it means is interviewing is a bit confusing for people because it sounds like you're sitting down and you're interrogating people. Inter means together, viewing means looking at and motivation is fairly self-explanatory. So all that statement means is looking at motivation together. That's all motivational interviewing is. People think it's this big highfalutin thing, but it's not. The principles are working alongside the client. Now, we are not terribly good at that. We're very good at giving lots of information, but actually starting from where the patient's at, being patient-centered, we're not terribly good at because there is a natural instinct. We want to guide people to the the thing that is going to improve their health quickest. So for example, smoking has the biggest impact on cancer, but somebody may not be ready to deal with that. So working alongside them with what they would like to change. Clients think about the issue for themselves. You have to think about things from your point of view. The responsibility is left with the client to make the change. They're the only ones that can make the change. We can't do it for them. We can try our hardest, but it's only going to come from motivation uh, within them to change and a role as a supporter, supporting them to make the changes and referring on to services if that is appropriate at that particular point. So you've seen this already and this is kind of at the centre of what we, what we do and what we believe in public health. Every healthcare encounter is a health improvement opportunity but I do wonder how much that's, that's believed by, by those in, in the, the health setting out there actually on the coalface and speaking with people. I once did a, a lecture and there was a professor of cardiology who I believe is now retired um, who said it's not my job to talk about smoking. My job is to cure people. Okay. Um, he suggested that the nurses should do it at that particular point. Um, but I believe everybody has a role. It's about what your role is and where your opportunities are. And it's not to dismiss it. I do truly believe that health improvement is part of everybody's job. 
What stops us from raising the issue? We've already talked about time being a factor. So what I would do is preempt some of these as uh, these are quite common. Time is quite common. It's not really my job. If you're a physiotherapist, why would you talk to somebody about their alcohol levels? What would the person think if I did start talking about alcohol? Someone else is going to do it. It probably fits in with somebody else's job. I'm giving people bad news. Why would I start telling them about what they should do or blaming them for, the, for getting to that particular point? What if they get defensive? What if it affects my relationship with my client or my patient? What if they don't want to come back and see me again? They're never going to change, so what's the point? I'm always having these conversations and nobody ever changes. What we're asking for, and we believe that this can fit into 90 seconds. Some of you will have more of an opportunity to have a discussion, others won't. But it's thinking about what are your opportunities and what can you fit into 90 seconds? Just slightly changing the way that you talk about behaviours um, can, can make a, a, an impact and make a difference. I once um, heard a talk by a chap who had terminal lung cancer who decided to stop smoking um, when he'd been diagnosed as terminal. And he talked about the benefits to him, but he also said quite interestingly in his talk, nobody had ever asked him if he wanted to stop smoking, which I think is shocking. And it is so quite often we decide on people's behalf that they're not ready to hear, they're not ready for that information, and that is not our right to do that. It's not my job. Do not, under, do not underestimate the influence that you saying this information or giving this information can have. You can sometimes say, well, if my doctor didn't mention it, it can't be important. If my nurse didn't talk about it, well, it, it can't really have that big an influence. I've already kind of covered this. But if you assume that someone else is going to do it and they assume that you've already done it, the person goes home with nobody having spoken about um, lifestyles. I'm giving people bad news. What's already been alluded to is a teachable moment, and there is evidence to show, and this is with smoking, that the moment of diagnosis and the duration of the treatment is a window of opportunity. Once people feel better and they're out of their treatment, the motivation has gone or has dropped substantially. People at a moment of diagnosis are motivated to make change. They want to know how they can get through their treatment, what the chances are or what they can do to reduce the chances of them having that uh, uh, recurrence. So using that is about how you do it though, uh, which is important. If you are using ORs, they are less likely to get defensive. If we are telling people what to do, yes, they will get defensive and they'll start justifying just as you did earlier on if you didn't have your five fruit in bed. But with other behaviours, you'll find yourself justifying why you've done things. And it actually increases your resolve to stick where you're at if somebody confronts you over it. So it's about how you do it. My dad's a retired consultant. And I asked him how he'd spoke to his patient, how he spoke to his patients about smoking. And he said, oh, I like to say, oh, Mr. Jones, have you been using your nicotine toothpaste again? And I was like, oh, how do you think that makes the patient feel? And I'm not sure he ever changed, but there we are. Um, but it's one of those things, it's thinking about how we broach things, how is that going to make the person feel, and we will look at that afterwards. They're never going to change equality. What is happening at the moment is that inequalities are getting wider, because the people who are most likely to make change and take on that information and advice are the most affluent and those who have the most confidence. The ones that are not taking it on are the least affluent and those with, with less resources or resilience to be able to cope with things. So we're actually making the situation worse by deciding who we give this information to. Um, we know that people from less affluent areas need more intensive support and more encouragement. Um, so we, we, we shouldn't be deciding who we're giving this information to. We should be giving it to everybody and trying to direct people into the support services that are available. Does anyone recognise this? <laughs> it's from Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. And what you have here is this is referred to as the leap of faith. If you remember this, but he's trying to get the, the Holy Grail for his dad because he's about to... Oh, I'm sorry if you've never seen it. He's <laughs> spoiling it somewhat. He needs to get the Holy Grail. Um, and he comes to what looks like a chasm at this point. When you look at a certain angle, you can't see how to get across. If you move slightly to a different angle, as you can see in the bottom picture, 
you see that in fact there's a bridge that's made of stone, but you can't see it from one certain point. Now imagine that you were Indiana Jones, you're standing there, and you didn't have that booklet that I explained, his dad had written all this stuff down. If you didn't have that booklet, and you find out afterward that somebody could have given you that information to get across there, but they decided not to tell you because they didn't think it was the right time for you. How would you feel? <laughs> yeah. We had a, a, a sorry, I, my examples tend to be smoking focused, but there was a lady whose son was diagnosed with glue ear um, and uh, unfortunately lost his hearing. And she found out afterwards that secondhand smoke is very strongly linked to glue ear in children. And she was so angry that nobody had ever told her about her smoking um, within the house with her child. And it's, it's these situations. Yeah, sometimes people will get defensive and sometimes they'll think, oh, what a busybody. But we have to be giving this information because otherwise we're not, we're not giving the full package of care that we should be giving. What I've got here, and I'll pass these round afterwards, this is a leaflet that you can use with your, your patients if you feel that it's appropriate. It's designed for staff to be able to show things to patients. Now, this fits in quite nicely with, with cancer. Um, an example of how to use this might be, you've got pictures there of, of various different things. And the way that you can use this is to say, when somebody has a diagnosis of cancer, we know that there are lots of different things that can improve the outcome of their care and reduce the chances of them having um, a recurrence. And so, some of these things are smoking, healthy weight, physical activity, healthy eating, alcohol intake. This question mark here is really for something that you maybe think is impacting in your condition and that you would like to talk about. There's also the stress of having that, situa having that condition. There might be other things as well, em employment, um, money worries that you have at the moment. That seems quite overwhelming and I know that that's a lot of things to deal with at the moment or to think about. But what I'd like to do today, is there anything there that you would like to start talking about in any depth? So you're handing the, it back to the patient. You've covered quite a few topics. You can also give a bit of a focus. So you could also say, from a health perspective, smoking is going to have the biggest impact um, on your treatment and recovery, etc. But it's over to you. What would you like to talk about? So you hand that control back to the patient. We know that they're more likely to change. You've given lots of health messages there. It may not seem like you've done very much. But it's better than handing lots of leaflets and saying you need to deal with all of these at the same time. Because if you get that, you're less likely to deal with anything uh, at that point. So I'll hand these round and you can have a look at those um, later on. Just to give you a bit of a, an overview of our uh, training, we have various different training programmes um, that are linked around this leaflet. So we have a level one training, which is 60 minutes, which is designed to bring to team meetings, to wards, um, just basically anywhere you can slot us in for 60 minutes. And it covers how to use this leaflet and the basics of good communication. There's level two, which is four hours, which is run on the first Wednesday of every month in various locations. And that gives a lot more in depth, well, as much as you can get in four hours and practicing those particular skills. Once you've done either level one or level two, you can then go online and do modules through LearnPro. So hopefully you'll all have access to LearnPro um, on the, the NHS computers. And then there's level three, which is something that's in development, which is for those whose day in, day out job is to deliver health behaviour change um, sessions. So that's a, a information there. You've got that in your handouts. If you are interested in any of those training courses, you can make a request for your team, for one of um, my team to come out and deliver the 60 minute session to you. Um, and the four hour when there's information and calendar on the PHRU website. We also, as part of this, we have information on all services um, through the info directory part of the NHS GGC website. So you can go on there and you can put in the area that you work in and it will give you a list of all of these services here, mental health, um, financial inclusion, smoking, blah, 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 particular to your area. So you can get up to date information on there if you are looking for services. Just to finish off, I do wonder if you sometimes feel that this is you in your job, you're fishing people out from the river, a very rapid flowing river, you're exhausted and you're you're dragging, all you're doing is throwing down the ropes and, and helping people at a very difficult point. 
I wonder if we thought a little bit differently and thought, see if I went up a wee bit and saw why they were all falling in and maybe helped with the, the mending of the bridge, maybe I would have to deal with less further on. And that's really my, my example um, of how health improvement is everybody's job. We need to start thinking much more widely and not just seeing the NHS as curing people. We need to think of where we can make a difference. So I would encourage you after today to take that 90 seconds and to make a difference. And I'm going to do a session um, after Anita, which will be looking at actually how you can do that and what are the difficult questions that you sometimes have to face and we can maybe work on some of those. So thank you.